We are friends united. We are friends united. We are friends united. Together, we are friends united. I mean, reconciliation is respect. Yeah. It's inclusion. It's not just being consulted. And, you know, we, we use and, and apply consultation a lot, but it's, it's the inclusion. It's actually having real say and input into the outcomes, into the decisions. Breathtaking pieces of art uh, from really across, across our country, uh, in particular from the Arctic, and uh, really stunning when you walk in and, and just see the visuals of these uh, incredible Aboriginal artists who have, uh, through stone and wood and canvas, produced these, these beautiful, beautiful uh, depictions of our country. And um, that is, uh, of course, such an important part of, of our First Nations culture. But it's, uh, it's woven into who we are as people, who we are as a country. And, uh, Rolf has done an amazing job at compiling some of these uh, these great pieces of art. I was thinking of your time as Justice Minister because y you brought in legislation that uh, put victims more at the center of what was happening in the justice system and certainly gave them a more prominent role. And that strikes me, I don't know if it was something you explicitly thought of at the time, but it strikes me as something that is borrowed or is ad adapted from the Aboriginal justice culture and thinking, you know, where in the sentencing circle, the victim is included and has a say and talks about, you know, how the crime has affected them. That's absolutely right, Adam. The true intent is going to be to keep momentum, to learn from what's been done thus far and, and build it up and build it up. And, and uh, most importantly, have Aboriginal people steering this process and getting us to uh, a, 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 a place that I think is going to make the country much more prosperous, much more competitive. There's so much to be learned just from slowing the pace and, and listening and really taking in what, what's being imparted by elders, by individuals who are out on the land. This is a, you know, this is a living example of it here at this incredible center where you see in particular the Aboriginal influence. But even within this, uh, this wonderful display, you see aspects of, of local Mi'kmaq uh, culture and art uh, mixed with the high north, our west coast, our plains uh, First Nations people. I think it has the capacity to bring people together um, even people who sometimes have very divergent political views or come from completely different ancestry or parts of the world, but they, they can somehow find common ground and a place that is for conversation, is for understanding, perspective. You know, what do you see in this particular piece of art? Yeah. What does it tell us about you that that's what jumped out? I, I, I just think it's... You know, it's sometimes intangible, but it, it is a very, very powerful and sometimes unifying force. Welcome to the Friends United International Conference Centre in Cleveland, Richmond County, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. And I'm pleased to be joined today by Peter McKay. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Adam. It's great to be with you and great to be in this gorgeous 
serene setting here in Cape Breton. Yeah, isn't it something? Uh, we just did a, a tour, a little walk around here uh, a minute ago. But uh, you were back here in t- 2015. Uh, I remember uh, we were here together and walked around a little bit. There's been uh, quite a few changes since then. Oh, there sure has. I mean, breathtaking pieces of art uh, from really across, across our country, uh, in particular from the Arctic. And uh, really stunning when you walk in and, and just see the visuals of these uh, incredible Aboriginal artists who have, uh, through stone and wood and canvas, produced these, these beautiful, beautiful uh, depictions of our country. And um, that is, uh, of course, such an important part of, of our First Nations culture. But it's, uh, it's woven into who we are as people, who we are as a country. And uh, Rolf has done an amazing job at compiling some of these, uh, these great pieces of art. It took, him, uh, it took him a long time. I've been involved uh, fairly closely over the last year, year and a half or so. But this has been, a, from his description, a 12-year effort to turn this building, which was a, a fish hatchery when he bought it, uh, into this art center that we see today. So it's been, uh, it's been quite something. Uh, I should introduce Peter first. It occurred to me as I was thinking about this that uh, we've known each other now for 25 years. <laughs> it was in 1997 when you were running the first time for, as a, to be a member of parliament that we met in Gajbro. So I was a student at Acadia then, but working at my mom's store. And uh, You, your parents, yeah. your grandparents. It's, uh, yeah, we've been connected a long time. But first through politics, then law, through sport, uh, through various other endeavors yeah. here in the province. And uh, Followed your career closely too, Adam. Well, it's been a good 25 years, I guess, in sense, some sense. You've been very successful since I've gotten, since you've gotten to know me. Well, that's true. <laughs> I, I, I kind of surfed your wake and, and uh, followed in your footsteps. <laughs> oh, so, uh, so for people, anyway, everybody knows these things. But uh, so, Peter, you were elected in 1997 as a uh, member of parliament in Central Nova. It was Cape Breton. It was sorry, it was picked up in Ganesh Garjbu at the time, but right. it's gone through a few different name changes. And then uh, you became leader of the Federal Progressive Conservative Party uh, just a few years uh, later. And uh, then subsequently, uh, yourself and Stephen Harper got together and reunited the Conservative Party of Canada and then formed government in 2006, 2006 until 2015. And so as part of that government, uh, as the... when. You guys were first elected in 2006. You were named the Foreign Affairs Minister. That's right. Which, I mean, I thought was a very important position, especially at the time. It was a new government. I mean, everybody in, across the globe would have known the Prime Minister, but, you know, you were in many ways the face of the government to the world. And so that seemed like a key role. And then you went into, uh, you became the Minister of Defense. Don't forget ACOA. And ACOA, certainly, yes, yes, uh, Minister for ACOA, the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. Uh, so certainly a very important role for uh, Atlantic Canada. Minister of Defense, uh, obviously during an important time. We were in uh, Afghanistan as a country at that time. And then uh, towards the end of the uh, uh, that time in government, you were the Minister of Justice. So we're going to talk about some of those things uh, uh, throughout uh, some of the discussion. But... Before we talk about your time in government, I mean, we're here to talk about reconciliation and indigenous issues. I thought I'd bring it back to before government, because when you were younger, when you were in your, your teens, you spent some time up north. I did, Adam. I um, actually sailed out of Mulgrave on a supply ship, a company uh, based out of Quebec originally, Federal Huron, and a Degagne shipping line that was taking supplies to the high Arctic. So many of the, the little communities that found along the, the, the high Arctic coastline. Um, and it was, it was really formative at that time. And I was young, I was 17, 18 years old. We, uh, and I, it was the first time I'd really encountered, um, really in any kind of a personal interactive way, uh, our First Nations, especially our Arctic First Nation. And, uh, you know, they were so welcoming to our communities. They, I mean, they were glad to see us. And I, one of the, the memories is of the kids who would be on the beach. And we were working around the clock, unloading 
uh, all sorts of life supplies, you know, building supplies, glass, skidoos, food supplies, many of things, the things were going to the Hudson Bay Company, but many of them were on order directly from families. But the kids would be there on the beach and we were taking it uh, from the ship on barges and bringing it ashore. I was driving heavy equipment and working as a stevedore. And, uh, and then sort of between some of these shifts, you'd have a chance to, to talk to these kids and talk to some of the, you know, the young people who were there. And uh, they were so curious and so excited that we were there. And um, I mean, it was, it was just a beautiful experience. I'll, I'll never forget how welcoming and how happy they were. And, you know, in this incredibly pristine environment, I mean, I remember we would see polar bears swimming by the bay in Pond Inlet. We, we were in Grease Fjord and you would see wolves, you'd hear wolves at night and, and you see narwhal in the, uh, in, the, in the bay. It was just, uh, it was almost surreal when I look back on it. But at, a, at such a, a young age, it, it made an indelible impression on me, a positive impression of, of our First Nations, of our Arctic, and, and the importance of, uh, of protecting that part of our country. Man, uh, protecting it in all corn kinds of ways. I mean, you know, environmentally and then, you know, militarily in a sense too. I mean, that's a big part of our country, but it must've just given you a real sense of the scale of the country. I mean, one can fly across the country and sense it, but going up north. It took us, I think, nine days to get there. We, we sailed up, stopped in uh, Labrador, stopped in Greenland and then made our way across towards the Northwest Passage. But, you know, years later, Adam, going back as Minister of National Defense on what was called Op Nanook, mm. which was a, a, an annual sovereignty exercise for the Canadian Armed Forces across all of the elements, land, air and sea. And our special forces were there as well. And they would do emergency response type of exercises in many of these same communities. And so two things that, that stood out, um, the amount of change, climate change, oh, you that had occurred. It. Oh, absolutely. I mean, some of these places were chock-a-block with ice yeah. in July and August when I had been there as a teenager. And going back almost 30 years later, mm -hmm. these waterways were completely open and free of ice. The permafrost seemed to have left the ground. Uh, there was more... Um, you know, fauna and, and flowering um, uh, material going on around the, these uh, villages and towns. And, and the second thing was there had been some degree of population growth. And so a little bit more infrastructure, a, a little bit more um, sort of, I guess they would call it southern influence and, uh, and just simply uh, a little bit more activity going on in, in many of these communities, which was encouraging to see. But, you know, also a reminder, as you say, of the, the need to preserve and protect culture, the environment, all that is, is sacred, but also the, you know, the inevitable march of progress that goes on everywhere, even in those remote high Arctic communities. No, it's a, it's a great way to meet people, I guess. I mean, there's different ways, you know, we think of the art because we're here in an art center. There's a, a great way to sort of break down barriers, uh, but meeting people while you're working, I mean, you know, that's, you're working together on a project, you you know, it's a less formal sort of atmosphere. It's a great way to kind of get to know people. It is. And it, and it was also framed in, in such positive terms. We were there delivering, you know, essentials of life basically in many ways. And, uh, and I also remember the entrepreneurial spirit of, of some of the people of the North who came with carvings. They, they came to just interact with us in, uh, in very human terms. And uh, I, I just, I, I came away with a whole new respect and appreciation for that part of our country, which frankly, very few people, no matter their level of interest, their, their desire will probably never set foot. Uh, because it, it, it's difficult to get there. It's extremely remote, which leads to problems for, you know, the cost of food and fuel. Um, times of the year, it's impassable and, and few roads, few transportation infrastructure links. No, I remember my, my parents, my father, after he retired from teaching, was up north in a Klavik teaching for four years and they'd come home in the summer. But I always wanted to go up and visit while they were there. Except he's like, okay, well, it's going to be two thousand dollars for your plane ticket, and it's going to take this many days to get the. Anyway, it was just a logistical issue and all that stuff. So, 
Our friend, our mutual friend, uh, Leona Glukak, uh, used to make register those points with us in, in, uh, in cabinet and in every discussion, you know, sh just the, the cost of living and the remoteness and, and the, you know, the challenging environment in which our, our Northern people live. Um, and it, it, it truly is hard to have appreciation for without seeing it, experience it, being on the ground. Well, you're, you're fortunate that you had that opportunity at a young age. I mean, lots of people are, you know, pumping gas or working at, you know, mowing lawns or doing any, anything else for a summer job, uh, McDonald's or something. You got to yeah, go up there and have that experience. Gift. The other thing I was thinking of as a sort of a non, I don't know, non-political way to interact is sports. And I was thinking of, you know, because I know you play hockey and rugby and baseball, uh, that not as good as you. Well, we're probably both retired from the very competitive aspects of our lives there. But I was thinking whether you would have played against picked a landing teams or, you know, just as a youth, just getting to, to meet people that way. There, there were kids uh, certainly that played uh, within the town leagues, yeah. particularly baseball and, and softball. In fact, I remember playing softball. This is a long time ago when I was probably, you know, 12, 13 years old. And uh, Morley Gugu, who was an incredible pitcher, yeah. you know, much, you know, as he got older, he was, uh, he was known around the province. And I remember watching him, but I remember playing uh, on Cape Breton Island. And I can't remember if it was at Waikagama or nearby at a tournament mm -hmm. where he was playing. And even at that young age, you, you could see his talent. And um, you're right. I mean, sports can be such a, a leveler and, and such a, a tremendous way for people to interact in, uh, you know, in a competitive environment, but in ways that, uh, that really take away any stigma or preconceived notion or, or prejudice that might exist. You know, you're just there, you're all on the same field together, and it doesn't matter if you're, you've got straight A's in school. Well, you've had that experience many times, more, more than I, but yes, Picto First Nation, but particularly coming to Cape Breton, um, on many occasions through different sports, uh, we, uh, you know, home teams in Pictou County, um, absolutely interacted with, with a lot of our, our first nations here in Cape Breton Island and they were formidable. They always had good teams. Well, I know Morley quite well, actually, because actually he and I played together for a few years. We were against each other, pitching against each other many times. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know quite what my record would be against Morley. It wouldn't, Probably under 500. He's pretty good. Uh, but we played together and uh, won an Eastern Canadian Championship together. Sports seems to be a great way to see, break down those barriers, uh, socioeconomic uh, or whatever the case may be. I wanted to think about a little another part of your, your sort of pre-political history, which was you were a Crown Prosecutor when you got elected. Uh, bef and bef you worked for uh, the Public Prosecution Service before that, before you were elected. And this was in the, the 90s, and this was in a time frame after the Donald Marshall Inquiry report had been completed, and there were some major changes to the Public Prosecution Service at that time. And uh, throughout this interview series, actually, Chief Stephen Augustine and myself were talking a little bit about the Donald Marshall story and the Institute. But I, I wondered if you had any reflections about that time in your career and just how the, the Marshall Inquiry kind of influenced the Public Prosecution Service. Well, it absolutely did. I, I came out of law school in 1990. I did my articles with the Attorney General's Department, and um, the Marshall decision, I believe, was handed down in 93 and then made its way through the courts, various iterations, appeals, up to the Supreme Court of Canada around 99. And then there were, there were two decisions. There was sort of Donald Marshall one, which talked about earning a moderate livelihood, and it, it all stemmed from charges against Donald Marshall Jr. for fishing eels illegally. Mm. And uh, so it was, a, it, it was a groundbreaking decision when it came to Aboriginal rights, not just in the fishery, but it later led to more broadly uh, in the resource sector. But of course, Donald Marshall, as you alluded to, was, was well known in criminal justice circles for his wrongful conviction where, if I'm not mistaken, he served 11 years for a murder that was committed in, a, I believe the place was Battery Park in, in Sydney. And uh, 
it was, it was someone else who committed the crime. And so it led to really landmark changes in the way that our public prosecution, in fact, the whole standing up of the public prosecution service was one of the direct results and recommendations of Mr. Justice Richards that came out of that report. So, yeah, I, I was sort of really beginning my, my legal career when all of this was being implemented in ways that were designed to frankly, put more safeguards in place, ensuring that the justice system was more just and inclusive and fair, that there were safeguards for everyone. And so, you know, it was obviously unintended on Donald Marshall's part, and he would never want to be the, the uh, instigator of this, I'm sure. Uh, but his, his wrongful conviction put in play so many positive, albeit unintended consequences for the evolution of a, of a better and, uh, and more functional criminal justice system. So we, we owe them a lot. It's amazing. You know, I think of this sometimes as a, from a criminal defense perspective, how could you ever function without getting full disclosure? <laughs> you know? Right. And that, that's true. These things, right. And the crown prosecutors, you know, going for wins instead of seeking justice. Well, it's trial by ambush. Yeah. You know, the, the defense counsel, and you've, you've done an awful lot of defense work, Adam, you, you show up, but you're, you're given essentially all of the, the police records, the information that the police uh, have given to the Crown to rely on to proceed with a charge. Imagine in, a, in an era where you showed up and all you have is the indictment. All yeah. you know is what the charge is none of the background, in some cases, not even who the witnesses will be. And it was, uh, it was an incredible uh, injustice that, uh, that occurred daily in our courtrooms when, you know, accused persons just, they didn't know what they were even accused of in many cases. No, I know the, uh, you know, and your time as a prosecutor certainly would have influenced your, your time in government as well, uh, especially, particularly, I would think, as your, your time as justice minister. It, very much so. And, and it was, in fact, I, I would call it the, the seminal reason for leaving the public prosecution service to run was I saw still, and, and arguably it's going to be an evolution as long as we have a justice system, but real fundamental shortcomings, particularly in the Young Offenders Act, um, particularly in the way we treated victims, uh, which I th think is still a big, big issue uh, across the country. And, and certainly Aboriginal people were, were not uh, being treated fairly and, and in an inclusive way in our justice system, and there were cultural reasons for that. And so we've, we've come a long way. We've, in fact, again, um, adopted some of the methodologies, including things such as sentencing circles, mm -hmm. the way we... Um, help offenders perhaps reconcile with the community and even with the victim in some cases. Much of that we've, we've borrowed and tried to adapt uh, into our justice system in meaningful ways. I was thinking about this, you know, the, the different ways in which the sort of political and legal cultures in Canada, the mainstream cultures, can adapt in uh, things from the Aboriginal political and legal cultures. And I was thinking of your time as Justice Minister because you brought in legislation that uh, put victims more at the center of what was happening in the justice system and certainly gave them a more prominent role. And that strikes me, I don't know if it was something you explicitly thought of at the time, but it strikes me as something that is borrowed or is ad adapted from the Aboriginal justice culture and thinking, you know, where in the sentencing circle, the victim is included and has a say and talks about, you know, how the crime has affected them. That's absolutely right, Adam. And, and I think, you know, early on in my, my legal career and certainly at the, the Crown Attorney's Office, many of those efforts around uh, real you know change to include victims in meaningful ways and and i did have a couple of experiences at pictou landing first nation where i saw that happening uh, i worked with an rcmp officer named ronnie knockwood who uh, was a very innovative thinker in terms of having t you know an aboriginal perspective that drew people together uh, in, in, in sometimes really difficult circumstances. As you know, in the criminal justice system, you're dealing with people who have been traumatized, who've been physically and psychologically injured in many cases. 
You have offenders themselves who have come through uh, extremely traumatic experience, which has you know, emancipated itself in, in different ways and, and caused uh, violence. And so our system, uh, you know, can very much look through an Aboriginal lens at times to, to try to bring about better outcomes. That, that's ultimately where we want to get. And the Victims' Bill of Rights certainly borrowed some of that, you know, philosophic approach to try to, you know, as the saying goes, put the victim back at the place that they would be had the crime not occurred. Very difficult to do in, in sure. some circumstances. But when you're able to bring people together in a, in a sense, and, and even something as simple as a, and it can be confrontational, but a chance to, to apologize, or for the, the, uh, the abuser or the individual who's caused the crime to hear how that victim felt. Yeah. And that can have profound implications around uh, recidivism and, and making that offender understand the consequence and, and the harm that they have caused to another person. Well, under the old system, they would just, they would be punished and they would be embittered perhaps because of that and, and excluded and yeah. taken out of the community exactly right and uh, rather than the aboriginal concept of trying to reintegrate the person but in, also improve the person throughout through the process so um, i i thought that was a very important piece uh, or not piece of legislation but an important statement uh, by the government to to say this is going to be the way justice is done now well my hope is that it will be more fully embraced than it has been, because I, I think there are still a lot of shortcomings when it, it, it comes back to that uh, genuine effort that, that's out there to treat victims in a more holistic way within the system so that they, they go away feeling at least that they've been heard, they've been respected, they've been included. Not, they're not the decision makers, sure. but they, they really want to know that their voice has made a difference. And, you know, that has really you know, ripple effect, far-reaching implications, because if a person who's in the justice system, let's never forget for reasons that they, you know, had nothing to do with, they, they were a victim, and uh, it impacts their, their view of whether they will want to serve on a jury, whether they will want to report a crime in the future, what they will tell their children and their neighbors about their experiences. I mean, the, the, the justice system sometimes very often, in fact, has very, very unseen and, and even insidious consequences if it's not properly it's administered. You know, the old adage that we learned back in law school that justice must not only be done, but seen to be done. Yes. And so, you know, yes, it impacts one person, offender and, and, uh, and victim, but it also affects everybody around them and most notably their family. So certainly that was an important issue and uh, right in the wheelhouse of being justice minister to bring in that kind of uh, legislation. But I mean, your government, that wasn't the only sort of Aboriginal uh, issue that was uh, in the forefront of your government. I mean, uh, we had the uh, apology from the, the prime minister, which I think was a very powerful moment in, in our country. And then even the fact of Leona Glucock being named a minister. I mean, uh, I guess, from your perspective, are, are those some of the highlights uh, during your time in government in terms of the, you know, Indigenous uh, relations? It goes beyond that. Those, are, those were certainly highlights, and I, I can't say enough positive about Leona and the impact that she had during her time, both as health minister and environment minister, two of the very, you know, difficult files, to, to say the least. And she brought with her the experience of having served at the, the territorial government level, which is a much less uh, acrimonious, confrontational type of system um, in the north. So she brought that experience and, and her, own, her own personal um, intelligence and insight into Aboriginal issues generally when they came to the cabinet table. Jim Prentice was Aboriginal minister and Bernard Valcour and during my, my time at Justice, um, in particular working with, uh, with Bernard around the land claims. And I remember early days being briefed by deputy ministers and, and those responsible within the department for some of these outstanding land claims and saying, you know, 
walk me through why we're still contesting some of these matters as opposed to trying to find a, you know, a, a peaceful resolution yeah. rather than working its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And another area where I recall, you know, and, and as sadly that it didn't come to pass, but was in the area of really as a federal government taking a major step towards turning over the responsibility of education to First Nations. Sean Atlio was a grand chief at that time. And we had very, you know, substantive discussions about how to best do that. And, you know, we were so close. We were very, very close to what I would have thought was a, you know, completely game-changing deal that would have seen much more responsibility around education and commensurate funding going to our First Nations which I think to this day should be aspirational and we should continue towards, along with reconciliation and many of these other aspects. But it was, you know, it was a genuine effort on the part of our government. Um, I would say we did so with far less fanfare and, and more purpose about maybe less talk, more action. And Leona informed so much of that. And I remember we had cabinet meetings uh, in Iqaluit, for example. Yeah. And, you know, I referenced going there numerous times with the Canadian Armed Forces. We have the Rangers there. We were, as a government and in and, and my capacity as minister, looking to expand the size of the Rangers unit, which is a predominantly uh, First Nations-led and, uh, and personed unit of the Canadian Armed Forces. They're called the eyes and the ears of the, uh, the armed forces in the north, but they, they do such an incredible amount of work and patrol and information gathering, and they interface. You know, one of my observations is they interface extremely well with other government departments in providing, uh, you know, geographic awareness, uh, situational awareness, knowledge of the local land and people and providing that to other government departments who are tasked to work there. The Rangers, uh, just a, it's such a unique element of being Canadian is to have that uh, as part of our, I guess part of our military, but part of our society. And what you just talk about, you know, education and having that sort of uh, devolved more to a local level, uh, that seems, strikes me as an important part of reconciliation uh, to Very give more responsibility. Very much so, Adam, and way beyond just the symbolism of it, um, like local policing, having local Aboriginal members serving in uniform and, and being part of that, albeit, you know, we're, we're still a long way from doing what I think is necessary to protect the Arctic and to promote sovereignty and ensure we're doing our, our level best to preserve that environment from climate change and, and spills and, and anything that's going to uh, really cause damage. But we really have a lot to learn from them. I mean, the, the, the Franklin expedition discovery, for example, had they simply, you know, the scientists, and this is not, not anti-science, but had they listened to local people and the folklore of where those ships were, yeah. I suspect we would have found them years ago. And, uh, you know, there, there are, there's so much to be learned just from slowing the pace and, and listening and really taking in what, what's being imparted by elders, by individuals who are out on the land. You know, the hunting um, community is such an important part of the culture and the respect that they have for, for the animals, for this, mainly the marine animals that live there. You know, um, it just came back to me, the, the best shot, the top shot in the Canadian Armed Forces during much of my, my six years there was a young man from the Arctic, and I wish I could think of his name, but he, uh, he was a hunter. Yeah. You know, he was a ranger, but his, his real occupation was as a hunter. And he used an old Lee Enfield rifle, and he was a left-handed shot, which meant he had to reach across the breach. And, you know, he was, he was at the Connaught Rifle Range one time when they were having a nationwide competition, and he was winning every competition, in spite of the fact that you had people with, you know, superior weaponry that were there, and they were taking part in this. And he, he was so fast and efficient and just such a deadly shot. 
And during one of the uh, presentations where he was being given his award, I asked him, I said, how did you get to be such an incredible shot? And he said, I've been hunting polar bears since I was six years old. He said, in most cases, you get one shot. Yeah. And I thought, well, there's no greater motive than that. You don't want to get too close either. <laughs> oh, well. Well, I was thinking about the, you know, yeah, the Franklin expedition. Did you, were you, when you were up north, were you guys, uh, did you have icebreaker ships? Adam, we, we are so uh, inadequately equipped when it comes to the conditions up there, especially in, in the, in the um, winter months. But we're, you know, we're committed to building an icebreaker that's well underway now in uh, the planning stages, at least on the West Coast. We're completing these offshore uh, Arctic patrol vessels, the so-called AOPS, at the uh, Irving shipyard. And so we're getting there, but it's going to require deep water refueling ca ca capacity at places like Nana Civic, mm. uh, reclamation of some of the old airfields that are there, roads, just connectivity, and the technology and, and where it's placed and how it's used, again, should be informed by our First Nations. But the, the idea of replacing our NORAD early warning system mm. is going to require satellite connectivity, again, and land, air, and sea that will allow us to have more situational awareness about external threats, but search and rescue, our ability to respond to a spill, God forbid, or some kind of an environmental threat, tracking wildlife research all of that is going to be aided by technology but i dare say that the the knowledge that should go into those systems mm -hmm. beyond just their technical capability uh, but their placement their their ability to integrate and to to use local uh, have local uh, application our aboriginal people should be very much front and center in those discussions. Well, that traditional knowledge, as you say, it's not, uh, it doesn't conflict with science. It's, it's compatible. It augments it. it you know, they, they can, everything can work together. So, I mean, to me, the development of the North and, you know, all of those things you're talking about, that's reconciliation too. I mean, it's essential for other reasons. I mean, we have to defend our country and know about these things that are happening. But it's also part of reconciliation efforts with the North. The, you know, these peoples who haven't been... Uh, respected or appreciated enough. And that's the key word. I mean, reconciliation is respect. Yeah. It's inclusion. It's not just being consulted. And, you know, we, we use and, and apply consultation a lot, but it's, it's the inclusion. It's actually having real say and input into the outcomes, into the decisions, into what, let's be honest, is going to have a, an enormous effect on our First Nations, on our Aboriginal people, first and foremost, ahead of everybody else. And so that path to reconciliation that we're still on um, really has a lot to do with being in the, in the wheelhouse, in the, in the boardroom when decisions are taken. And, uh, you know, I, I was proud of a government. Uh, you mentioned Leona, but we had uh, Peter Panashawe right. from Labrador, Northern Labrador. We had... Um, uh, Shelley Glover, who was of Métis ancestry, as was Rod Brunouge and, and Rob Clark. So, it, and, and that's not at all, you know, tokenism or saying, you know, look, I have a friend or I had a colleague. It's, it's really saying, you know, this is an important part of what are the next steps and the one after that that decisions are being taken um, by Aboriginal people and, and informed ones, ones that, uh, that, that really are going to get us to that proverbial better place. Well, I'm familiar, of course, we know Leona Glukark here. She's been part of this interview series and she's been here to the center a few times and, you know, just a very intelligent, formidable person. So, uh, yes, absolutely not a token, but at the same time, an important symbol to her people, to the country that, you know, here is a cabinet minister and somebody who's fulfilling very important roles. And so there's a sense that, you know, others can aspire to that position uh, now. And performed brilliantly. You know, I, uh, I remember watching in awe as she uh, took questions in the House of Commons, as she spoke out in, in such passionate ways at cabinet meetings. And uh, one of the great stories that I, I love to, to remind people about Leona was that she was also Canada's representative to the Arctic Council. 
which is an incredibly important international body now, perhaps arguably more than ever, uh, because, and it's suspended right now due to the war in, uh, in Ukraine, the, the invasion, the illegal invasion of Russia. But during my time as a foreign minister, my counterpart in Russia was a guy named Sergei Lavrov, still the foreign minister in Russia, which speaks to their yeah, system. But usually the foreign minister in many countries is de facto the Arctic Council minister. Not so in Canada. Uh, Leona filled that role during our time in government and during her tenure. And so I was happy to defer to her, but I worked with her on many of those files. But did she ever put Sergei Lavrov in his place? And I, I sat around NATO tables, then G8 tables. I'd seen Sergei Lavrov and he was no pushover. He had yeah. 10 years experience at the United Nations, you know, a, a hard nosed diplomatic Soviet style politician. And I saw Leona go up one side of him and down the other and lay out the facts and tell him, you know, this is the way it is. And she chaired the Arctic Council during much of uh, her time when Canada was the, 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 the rotating chair of the Arctic Council. So Leona has left an indelible mark uh, in this country in politics. Uh, her time as environment minister, her time she, she was... Um, Interestingly, in the context of what we've just come through with COVID, she was the health minister during the H1N1 uh, crisis in Canada. So just an outstanding Canadian and uh, representative of her community. And uh, now we're, we're the beneficiaries of having her in, in Cape Breton. I, I run into her in hockey rinks from time to time because yeah, our sons that's... are about the same age. <laughs> Well, that's great. Well, sports, again, bringing people together in different ways. So that's, uh, that's excellent. Uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the political and legal cultures taking on, uh, you know, aspects of, of uh, Indigenous cultures and, and practices. Um, I guess maybe as, a, as a, just a closing topic, we, you know, we've, we're here in this art centre, you know, you've traveled the country uh, many times over and, you know, you see people interacting. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you think art has the capability of tearing down barriers, bringing people together. Well, art is, is such a, a physical expression of, of a person. My, my mother, uh, who was Irish, uh, was an artist. Uh, my mother-in-law is an artist who uh, is Persian. And so there's a, there's a cultural influence, but I guess to the point, it, it causes a, uh, a person to really create something that is part of themselves. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's often a mix of their experience, of their own cultural upbringing or awareness. It is influenced though by the person's own life journeys. You know, whether they have been in an Aboriginal setting or perhaps in, in Mexico or Peru or Europe, they, they bring those memories and those, uh, th those pieces of their experience together in various art forms. And this is a, you know, this is a living example of it here at this incredible center where you see in particular the Aboriginal influence. But even within this, uh, this wonderful display, you see aspects of, of local Mi'kmaq uh, culture and art uh, mixed with the high north, our west coast, our plains uh, First Nations people. I mean, art to me is, is extremely powerful and, it, and yet it can also be calming. Like I, I always uh, am amazed when you walk into a museum and you become sort of drawn in or transfixed on a particular art and everybody has their preferences yeah. you know what the piece that you might choose to be the, the one that you know is most meaningful or powerful to you completely different yeah. from your spouse or or from your children or or you know again so it, it has a very personal and and moving component to it i find art uh, and, and i studied art a little bit um in college and i have always sort of gone back to it and, and, you know, looked at pieces of art and books and tried to surround myself in my own home with, uh, with pieces of art, whether it was paintings that my mother did or now my, my mother-in-law, uh, or even I, I came across some things that I did as a child 
And it sort of sparked memories as I was watching my, my daughter, who seems to be quite interested in art and has taken up drawing. And, and it's, um, it's like sport. It, it isn't a driving force for everybody. But I think, you know, coming back to your question, I think it has the capacity to bring people together. Um, even people who sometimes have very divergent political views or come from completely different ancestry or parts of the world, but they, they can somehow find common ground and a place that is for conversation, is for understanding, perspective. You know, what do you see in this particular piece of art? Yeah. What does it tell us about you that that's what jumped out? I, I, I just think it's, you know, it's sometimes intangible, but it, it is a very, very powerful and sometimes unifying force. Um, and there's no particular, there's no particular venue. There's no particular type of art. It just, it moves people in different ways. Music is yeah. the same. It's the same, you know, it just, yeah, it connects us as, as humans in ways that it's so much more difficult to do in just sometimes even in conversation or, you know, whatever other issues of, you know, communities are dealing with, uh, I, I, it's just a, a way to break those walls down and sort of unite us more so well it's excellence it's uh you know some would say a higher calling when you when you use the expression somebody who's very good you know it, they've they've got it down to a fine art yeah art is uh is life it's a very very important part of uh, of who we are as a people in provincial politics there's so much less of a there's less of a partisan divide ideologically right yeah. federally i'm not sure it's quite so such a smooth trajectory, if you could think of it that way. Yeah, I, th so. I think federal politics, just because it is arguably on a, and, and this is no disrespect to our provincial and municipal levels of government, but the stakes are sometimes higher. The jurisdiction is so much broader. You know, the country itself um, makes it more challenging than at the provincial level where you can say, you know, this is within our provincial jurisdiction. And so that can arguably make it harder to find consensus. And I, I suspect that, you know, Aboriginal councils would say the same, that, that they, you know, the, the, the Mi'kmaq uh, perspective versus uh, Ojibwa or Cree can be, can be different. But I think, you know, I, I very much agree with the sentiment that I think uh, Premier MacDonald and McNeil and others have expressed, and that is one would hope that this and, and, you know, I, I, again, I, I struggle to use the word incremental, but it has been incrementalism that has taken us further towards, you know, true reconciliation. One would hope that this isn't every time that we change government, well, we have to hit restart. No, exactly. Right. Or that this government, uh, you know, there's a sometimes a tendency to try to diminish what the previous administration did for partisan purposes. And I, I, we can't afford to do that. And I, I would hope that, you know, with every change of government, there's a recognition that, look, these are all important foundational building blocks that we need to continue. And whether it's, it's court cases, whether it's you know, infrastructure investments, whether it is, you know, the, the important inclusion in government decision making, that the, the, the true intent is going to be to keep momentum, to learn from what's been done thus far and, and build it up and build it up and, and uh, most importantly, have Aboriginal people steering this process and getting us to uh, a, 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 a place that I think is going to make the country much more prosperous, much more competitive, um, really a leader in the 21st century, because it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not our country's proud history around our, our Aboriginal people that, um, it, it, it's that history that I think will, will be very difficult to allow us to reach our true potential unless uh, we find that better place. No, 100%. Uh, I just think to have your perspective on those issues and to, to, to hear about your experiences up north and across the country is going to be very valuable for a lot of people. So 
really want to thank you for coming here and sharing that with us and uh, just, you know, telling us a little bit about what you're thinking and what you've been doing. Oh, thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate that. Appreciate your friendship. And uh, it's been a great conversation. We are friends united. We are friends united. We are friends united. Together, we are friends united.